Hi, this is Mike Fauche, and a while ago I did a couple of videos on building your own network cables that were really popular. In today's video, I want to go through other things that you should know when installing Ethernet cables, such as the different type of keystone jacks, RJ45 connectors, any tools you might need, cable repair, as well as discuss the differences between shielded and unshielded cable. If you want to learn more about this topic, then watch the rest of this video. And please don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you find this video useful. Before we start on this topic, I did want to thank the team at VCE Link who supplied some of the items that I used in this video. As a longtime customer, I reached out to them and they graciously agreed to supply some of the items for today's video, but they haven't paid for or influenced this video in any way. There are some basic items you need to effectively terminate your own cables. The first is a cable stripper, which is used primarily for removing the outside insulation from the Ethernet cable and revealing the inner conductors. There are many different brands of strippers out there that can be used, and for the most part, they all do a pretty good job. My only recommendation is that you look for one with an adjustable blade, as the outer wire insulation can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, as well as between the different types. Having an adjustable blade helps you compensate for these variations. A good wire stripper will also work on a variety of different size cables, such as CAT6, CAT6A, CAT7, or CAT8, and work with both shielded and unshielded cables. You simply adjust it for that batch of cable and you're good to go. I know some people use a knife or a razor to strip the outer insulation. I would not recommend it and I would suggest using a proper stripper in order to protect the insulation of the individual conductors underneath the insulation. Next, let's talk about testers. These are important to have and fortunately most of these are pretty low cost devices. There's a wide variety of testers ranging from sub $10 to thousands of dollars depending on the features and the capabilities you're looking for. The lowest cost testers mainly verify that you have wired it correctly and that there are no open contacts, which is pretty much all you need for a DYI application. Some will also measure the length of the cable, which is sometimes helpful as well. You just plug in the remote on one end and your meter on the other end, and it will run the check, making sure your cable is wired correctly. In certain applications, you may need what's called a punch down tool. We'll talk more about this later in the video when we cover keystones. But patch panels and many keystone jacks require a punch down tool, which effectively pushes the wire into the contact and cuts off the excess wire. Lastly are crimpers. These are obviously required, but fortunately most of these that are made for network cables are pretty universal. There are a couple things you should know before buying a crimp tool. When you look at the product description, you'll often see the phrase pass through listed in the description. This indicates that it was made for a pass-through style RJ45 connector, such as the one pictured, and they typically have a cutting blade that trims off the excess cable after the wire cr gets crimped. There are some connectors, which we'll talk more about later in this video, that are non-pass-through, though typically much more difficult to work with, so I tend to stay away from them. My suggestion is that you get a pass-through style when ordering your crimping tool, as well as your RJ45 connectors. I'll put links to everything that we talk about today should you want to check it out or find out additional information. Before we get into the different connectors, jacks, and couplers, let's quickly go over wiring diagrams and color codes. For networking, there are two types of wiring standards, the T568A and the T568B. If you search on Google as to which one you should use, you're going to find varying opinions and even some contradicting information on this topic. But in my opinion, you should always use the T568B for networking. The T568B configuration has been the networking standard for many years, and it's why I recommend using it. As a side note, this is pretty much all you can buy when you're ordering a patch cable from Amazon or your local brick and mortar store. So now that we've covered some of the tools, let's get into the connectors themselves, starting with a traditional RJ45 pass-through connector used for unshielded wires. Looking at this type of connector, we can see that it's made out of a clear plastic shell and it allows wires to protrude past the end of the connector. This makes things a whole lot easier when you want to verify that you've inserted the wires in the correct order. If you're running unshielded wires such as CAT5E or CAT6, this is the type of connector that you'll use most of the time. 
As you can see when the wires are inserted into the connector, they pass through and stick out the end of the connector. When you insert the connector into the crimping tool and crimp the wire, the crimping tool will also cut off the excess wire. Taking a quick look at a non-pass through connector, they're almost the same except that the end is blocked and it doesn't allow the wires to protrude and typically relies on a small wire guide to keep things in the correct order and insert into the connector when you're ready to crimp. In my opinion, these are far more difficult to work with as you really can't easily verify the wire color or pattern. In addition, I've had issues with the reliability of this type of non-pass through connector if the wires are not inserted correctly. Lastly, let's talk about shielded connectors that are used for shielded wires. One additional consideration is when you're buying a crimping tool, I would make sure that it supports pass-through as well as the ability to crimp the shield tab. Crimping the shield is a separate process and ideally you want your crimp tool that supports both. Looking at this connector, you can see that the connector itself is all metal and it has an extra section that's used for attaching the shield. The shield is wrapped around the insulation and when you crimp this ground tab around the shield with your crimp tool, such as the one that I'm using from VCE Link, it grounds that shield to the connector. Shifting to keystones, these are usually used for in-wall configurations and patch panels. If you're going to run an ethernet cable in your home or business, you'll most likely want to use one keystone on at least one side. These are typically used to terminate a cable and a wall plate and provide your devices a place to plug into. As with many of the things that we discussed today, there's also some variations in keystones. The main differences are the tool and toolless configurations as well as shielded and non-shielded versions. Looking at this example, we can see a typical use for a keystone jack. These are really low cost and easy to use, but most will require a punch down tool to install the wire into the jack correctly. If you're installing Cat5e or 6, this should be sufficient. However, if you're running a shielded cable like 6a, 7, or 8, you'll want to use a shielded version of the Keystone jack like this one. Many of these shielded connectors are available in the toolless versions. Shielded Keystones tend to be much more expensive because of their construction. You can see that when you compare these, they're quite a bit larger, typically made of metal, and provide a way to ground the cable. When it comes to couplers, again, there's some variations. You have the standard unshielded type, which uses an RJ45 jack on each end and provides you the ability to lengthen a cable. When you use shielded cable, you need to make sure that your coupler is also shielded, so check the description when you're purchasing one. We'll talk more about when to use shielded cables and connectors later in this video. This type of coupler can be used for a variety of applications such as patch panels or for extending an existing cable. On the topic of extending cables, there's a couple of options when you're extending or repairing a cable. In most cases, if you just need to extend a cable a few feet, you'll just grab a patch cable and a regular coupler and just extend it. However, when you need to repair a longer cable, or cables in the wall, you'll want a more reliable connection. One great option for higher reliability and higher performance connection is to use the inline coupler like these VCE Link tool-free couplers. These are designed to be toolless so they can easily be installed in the field and they support CAT6, CAT6A, CAT7 shielded and non-shielded cables and they're recommended for higher reliability and higher bandwidth connection. These are ideal for repairing damaged cables that need the highest signal integrity and fully support 10 gig connections. Though these are a bit pricey, they're a great way to extend or repair a shielded cable. I'll leave links to these in the description if you want to check these out. Lastly, let's talk about when and why to use a shielded cable. There's really no absolutes in determining whether or not you want to use a shielded cable. However, I try to follow some of these ground rules. First off, if you're running wires in a harsh environment that's near power lines or any kind of power source, power poles, cell transmitters, or any type of radio interference from equipment, I would suggest using shielded cables. You'll have to assess the environment that you're in and make a determination whether or not you need to spend the extra money for shielded cable because it is quite a bit more money. And remember that it won't hurt to have the shielded cable even if you really didn't need it in the first place. However, you can run into issues if you use standard cable in areas that have a lot of interference. Either way, make sure you test the full speed of your connection once you have it installed and make sure that you're getting the speed that you should be getting. Anyway, that's about it for today's video. And don't forget to give it a like if you found this useful. Please don't forget to subscribe as it really helps support the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.